Jesus. We thank you, loving God, for your goodness and your love. We thank you, God, for your power. We thank you, loving Jesus, that we have been delivered from sin by your power and by your love and by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now, loving God, we give you glory. We praise and lift up the name of Jesus. There's power in his name. There's healing in his name. There's deliverance in his name. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. How many are thankful for Jesus today? Amen. At this time, the brethren are going to come to help us to receive our Sunday morning worship offering and Sunday morning worship tithe. Amen. All Christians pay tithe. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says anyhow. We pay our tithe. That's 10% of our gross income. I pay tithe. I give to God. I give in offerings. I pay my tithe. And so you do the same thing, and God will support the work here, and with our help, and good things will happen. And God bless you is our prayers you give unto him. You can give online. There's a QR code. You can even scan it from your seat. It works. It goes right to our website or on Cash App at dollar sign NTCC Junction City. You can give that way or, or just use a tithe envelope or, or put cash in the bags. God will bless you, but let's receive a good offering as unto the Lord. And don't forget about the pledges that you made. Those of you that made pledges, I have a running tally of that. So please be mindful of that. You promised. That's what you said you could give. And so let's be uh, faithful to those things. And if you give them those pledges, you need to let me know that it's a pledge giving. All right. God bless you is our prayer. Brother Ron, sir, please pray. Ask God to bless the gift and the giver. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your giving. God bless you for it. God is good. Appreciate those that came yesterday to help do different things. And Jim was out there. Was it fertilizer and grass seed? Fertilizing, doing grass seed. So he was just walking around the buildings. But he's putting out some fertilizer, some grass seed. We appreciate that. And, and uh, other things outside, cleaning the curbs, all that junk that's in the curbs out there. And Got some things done, so we appreciate your faithfulness. And, and Naomi and uh, Rahel were here. They were cleaning inside the church, keeping our church nice and clean for us, all right? So, and I know that, that uh, some could not make it for various different reasons, but for those that did show up, God bless you. Uh, Ashton was here. He's a good worker. And uh, uh, what's his name? Caleb, you know your name. He owes me some time anyhow, so. That's a long story. And uh, Saul was here, got things done, so it was a real blessing. Well, what did you do, Pastor? I just walked around and told people what to do. <laughs> kind of. I did some things, all right, just for eye wash looks good, right? So, but anyway, we're very, very thankful for that. My, my, assistant, my assistant boss over here, right? <laughs> we're not really bosses. Neither one of us, we don't have that attitude. We just want to work for the Lord. Amen. And I know that I'm the pastor, I know that he's my associate, and I appreciate that, all that he does, but, but we don't have a, a boss-employee relationship, right? That's not the way that it is. We work together for the glory of God. So he does the things that I can't do. So young people get down on their knees and do things, right? And as old people sit down on chairs and say, okay, this is as close as I can get. So, but it's all good. And when Reverend Palmer was here, 
we wanted to change the, the uh, kitchen faucet in the house. Because Reverend Palmer, you know, he's short and he's skinny, right? And uh, I said, Reverend Palmer, I said, we're going to change. And so it's either me underneath the sink, Reverend Myers in the sink, or, you know, let's go down the sides. Next down to that is Reverend Palmer. And um, I said, you're going to change this kitchen faucet. He said, I don't know how. I said, you will in a minute. So I gave him instructions, and he changed it. That's the joys of being small. You can get under the cabinet, right? I can get under the cabinet. Getting back out of the cabinet is a different story, all right? So praise God. So anyhow, it's good. We work together to see something done for the Lord. I'd like to read to you this morning from the book of Job, chapter 2. Job, chapter 2, verse 7. So when Satan... So, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Then I like to look to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. And then one more verse of scripture found in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight. And I'd like to preach to you this morning for a little while on the title of a message, Faith is Integrity. Faith is Integrity. Reverend Meyer, sir, please pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and allowing us to be gathered here tonight this morning, God, to worship. Lord, I ask that you would help pastors and preachers, God. Give them the words of speaking, God. Speak to our hearts. Open up our ears to what you have for us. Have your way, God, in the remainder of this service. We praise you and give you all the glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so as some of you remember, we have began a message about faith, a series of messages on faith. And each week we are defining a letter of the word and we're spelling out what faith really is. All right, so... Again, the goal is, number one, a restoring of faith to those who once had it. How many times do we allow our faith to be sapped away from us? Can anyone testify to that? To where things happen in our life and things, uh, you know, kind of, you know, all right, we start out believing God, but things happen. And now our belief is kind of like, whoa, what's going on? So our prayer is that you'll have a restoring your faith. Number two, an increase of faith to those who want more. How many want your faith in God to increase? Don't you get tired of being plagued by doubts in your mind and doubts in your heart? And so when we allow God to increase our faith, we can step out and believe God in everything. Praise God. And then, number three, an exercising of our faith to do and to be more for God. I believe that every one of us can do better for the Lord. All of us, myself, every one of us, we can do more for God. And we have to believe God and step out in God and stand upon his promises every day. Praise God. All right, so the letter F, we talked about what faith was itself. We talked about what faith was and how that it is an unquestioning belief and trust. I believe and I really think that we need to have an unquestioning belief and trust in God. All right, Pastor, I understand that, but no, 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 no. I told you about yeah, but Christians before, right? How many know what a yeah, but Christian is? Some of you should know. You've heard this before. How many, doesn't, how many does not know what a yeah, but Christian is? All right. A couple honest hands there. Some of you did not raise your hands, so you're just sitting there lying. But it's all right. All right. A yeah, but Christian is God says, I want you to do this. I want this to happen. And, and we say, yeah, but... God says, live for me and I'll bless you. Yeah, but God says, have faith in me every day. Yeah, but so we become, yeah, but Christians. Uh, no, we ought to say, become yes, Lord, Christians. Uh, yes, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. Yes, God, I want to live for you. Yes, God, I know you can help me. And so let's put away the yeah, buts uh, and let's become yes, Lord, Christians. Amen. Amen. 
So then we talk, took it a step further and we shared how that faith is action. Action. All right, it's easy to say that you believe God. How many have ever heard the phrase, talks cheap? And yes, we all know that, right? People say all this kind of stuff and, and how they can do things, but then when it comes down to doing it, they don't do it. Talks cheap. Faith is more than just believing something is true, but it's also willing to take action on what you believe is true. All right, sometimes we do not take action because deep down in our hearts, we just don't believe. Let's just talk about it the way that it is, right? So, so God says, do this. And because we have it reasoned out in our minds and in our hearts, this is what I believe. And you can believe whatever you want to believe, but that does not change the word of God. And so when we believe God and we have that unquestioning belief and trust in God, we're going to have action behind that belief. All right. So your faith or in other words, your belief and your trust determines your actions. It's one thing to believe God and trust in God. Say, God, whatever you want me to do. And God says, all right, go do this. Okay, God, I'll do anything but that. Is that faith? No. All right, so action. So let's go on. Say, praise God, I missed service last week. Well, hallelujah. Well, let's talk then about letter I. As you already know, faith is integrity. What is integrity? According to the dictionary, it's defined from a Greek word meaning completeness, innocence, and upright. Uprightness of character and honesty. Unimpaired state of soundness. Undivided or unbroken a completeness. It also means fidelity and virtue. And so the overwhelming meaning of the word is the uprightness of heart and honesty. It can be said like this, that integrity does what is right even when no one else is around. You know what? We need to be Christians even when we're by ourselves. When you're at home by yourselves, we need to be Christians. When you're in the barracks by yourself, you need to be a Christian. When nobody is around, the preacher is gone, the brothers and sisters are gone, everyone is gone. But I want you to know God is still there, and God still sees, and he knows everything. And we need to be right even when nobody else is around. Amen. You say, all right, pastor, what does this have to do with my faith? God says it has everything to do with our faith. Because if we are not upright, and if we are not right in the eyes of God, then it doesn't really matter how much that you believe. How many believe that God is still God? How many believe that Jesus rose again on the third day? Amen. Amen. Easter's coming right around the corner, but I don't have to wait three weeks to talk about Easter. Jesus is alive, all right? Say, well, uh, there are people that believe that. Before I got saved, I believed all that, but I was not right with God. The Bible says even the devils believe and tremble. Does that mean they're saved on their way to heaven? No. All right, so you can say uh, that I, I believe, I believe that God is God, I believe this is right, but if you are not right in the eyes of God, it doesn't really matter how much you believe. Our heart must be right in the eyes of the Lord in order for God's word to be fulfilled in us. All right, how many want the blessings of God? How many want the promises of God, right? We sing that song sometimes, standing on the promises of Christ, my King, right? And we stand upon these promises that we have. We want to implement them in our lives. We want joy and peace and love and soundness of mind and power to live for Him. But we need to be right with God. You can't have a heart full of sin and expect the blessings of God. How do we make our hearts right? How do we make ourselves right? Very easy, and we know. By accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and then, all right? Aren't you glad you've given your life to God? Amen. We realize that we were sinners. Oh, man, God, I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. How many's ever done that? Yes. And if you've never done that, today would be a great day to ask Jesus into your heart. Amen. All right, so we've come to God. We've accepted Christ into our life. Praise the Lord. Amen? Yes. But then... 
We have to live by his divine precepts. Well, I actually have Jesus in my heart, preacher. Praise God. How's it been since then? Now, I, I, nowhere do I read in my Bible that we can give our life to God and, and accept Jesus into our life and continue living the way that we used to be. It doesn't say that. I'm not saying that you won't make a mistake. I'm not saying that you won't mess up. What I'm saying is we change the way that we live. And we get saved, all right? I say, well, what are you saved from? We are saved from that life of sin. We no longer have that death sentence hanging over our head because we accepted Christ into our life. But come into my life, Jesus. I'm calling upon you. And guess what? We'll be saved according to his word. But then we have to continue on living for him. Amen. All right, so you gave your life to God. I rejoice with you, but how's it been since then? Every one of us must understand and realize that God cannot and will not bless outside of his word. Now, we want to claim the promises of God and we want to claim all the good things that we have. And the Bible does tell us that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. If we want these things in our life, we have to live right. And you say, well, we're saved by grace. I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about living for God. Yes, we are saved by grace. And yes, we are thankful for that amazing grace. But what are we going to do after that? And over and over and over we hear about how that we are now saved. All things are passed away, right? All things are become new and all things are of God, right? How many times have we heard that? So we get right with God. But now we have to live that way. People expect God to bless them. Even though their heart is not right in the sight of God. People want, again, they want the peace, the love, the blessings, but they're living in sin. And I'm not here to condemn you this morning. I'm here to tell you that there's a way out of that mess. How many are glad that Jesus has set you free? Right? But you, can't, you cannot live in sin and expect the blessings of God. And, and sometimes when things are going wrong and things are messed up, you know, a, good, a good word of advice is to stop Look at your heart, look at your life, to see if you've opened up yourself to something that should not be there. I don't care if you've been saved a year or 40 years, right? When things begin to go wrong, a good place to start is with yourself. But no, we have the propensity to blame everybody except ourselves, right? We want to blame the army. It's my sergeant. It's Fort Riley. Preacher, preacher, you were never stationed at Fort Riley, so you don't understand. The army is the army. And I know there might be places that are better than other places, but it's all on us, right? Well, I tell you what the problem is. It's that preacher over there. It's okay. I've been blamed for worse, all right? And even though it's not true. And, and so all these things happen. But when things begin to go wrong in your life, and, and there might be things that are causing problems, right? But why don't you stop and pray and reflect upon yourself? How is my heart before God? And you hear me preach about it. You hear him preach about it, about being right with God. So what does that mean, being right with God? That means that we are in agreement with God. Things are good between us and God. Things are going well between us and God. When you're not right with God, there's something in the way. And that's called sin. It's called self. And so we need to stop and reflect upon, all right, am I living the way I'm supposed to live? And I really contend and believe that most people know when they're living right and they know when they're living wrong. All right? So, how many know that lying is wrong? But people lie. It really goes against integrity, right? How can you live a life of a lie when we're supposed to be serving a God of truth? Integrity, honesty, right? Well, I'm not really lying, but if you're causing me to believe something that's not really true, you've made a lie. Right? Why are things going wrong in my life? Maybe because you don't have integrity before God. And the best thing, God... You know what, my friends? God already knows what's on the inside. You're not, you might fool us, but you're not going to fool God. And that's what matters the most. All right, so I thought about it, and this is maybe a little bit of a lame uh, example. But, you know, thank God for Christian parents. Yes, sir. Right? So, or parents, they instruct their kids. All right, this is what I want you to do. I want you to clean your room. I want you to take out the trash. Clean up this room. Do your homework. Then... You can have the ice cream. Cool. So they take out the trash. 
they partly clean their room, and they do not do their homework, would you still give them the ice cream? Well, I think you should, because I'm woke, and I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Not in my house. Even though I might have been spoiled a little bit when I was growing up. Uh-huh. Yeah. But my mom and dad, they still had standards that we had to live by. Amen? And so it's the same thing with God. Why would God bless us, his children, if we are not living correctly? God loves you. And the Bible even says that God corrects those whom he loves. All right, so if God gets on our case, we ought to thank God for it. Now, a parent who let the kids just do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, go do what they want to do, stay out all night long, that's not a good parent. Well, that's your opinion. So be it. It is my opinion. Right? But the Bible says that we should raise up the children in the right way. But so, so if, and sometimes as kids, we don't like the rules that our parents impose upon us. Hmm? The kids over there in Sunday school right now, so I can't ask them. Ruthie, you're an adult now, so you don't count. All right, what, Caleb, does your mom let you do whatever you want to do? I could go on and embarrass you, make you ask you if you think it's fair or not, but I'll let you, I'll let you off the hook right now. Because most times, like kids, we don't understand, we don't get it. We're like, what's the big deal? To quote somebody that I heard today, it is what it is. <laughs> right? I heard someone saying that today as they're walking into church. I don't know what they were talking about, but it is what it is. Right? I'm not going to say their name or hell, so don't worry. All right, so <laughs> the thing about it is, We don't like this, so we want the blessings of God. But again, why? The Bible says this in Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. I like this. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. There's good news in the house. Come on, if we just do right, God's going to bless you. Why is that so hard for you to comprehend? Just do the right thing. Oh, but pastor, I'm living in sin. Well, then expect the judgment of sin. Right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, oh, hallelujah, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, look, here's, here it is, believing God, having action, and doing the right thing. Romans 8.28, a, a, a verse of scripture we use so much. And we know... All things work together for good to them that what? Love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. How many love God? Amen. But things are going wrong. Praise God that God can help us, all right? Walk uprightly. I cannot. Well, people don't like this. And, and they don't like accountability. And they don't like to be told how they're supposed to live. Well, guess what? The same things I'm telling you is the same thing that I have to do. I'm not exempt because I'm the pastor. No, I have to live right too. And if I want to be blessed by God, I have to live right. And if things are going wrong, I've got to get down on my knees or find somewhere to pray and say, God, what's going on in my life, first of all, so that I can be sure that I am in a right relationship with God. How many love God? If you love God, you will keep his commandments. Those are not my words. If we love him, we'll do what he tells us to do. This is where integrity comes in and comes into play in the life of a Christian. The part of living for God means that we are going to do right. I'm not saying we're perfect. But at least put forth some effort. It's easy to find fault. Sometimes if people would put that energy they have in finding fault, put that energy living for God, they make great Christians. Well, I'm waiting. Pastor, I'm finding fault with you. It's easy to find fault with me because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an imperfect human being. But so are you. We're in this thing together. All right? But take that energy rather than finding fault. And take that energy for your life to live for God. Amen? Integrity. Why do we do what is right? Why do we do it? I'll tell you why. Are you ready for this? Because it's the right thing to do. (laughs) That was disappointing. I was expecting this great nugget of knowledge from the throne of God. 
We do what is right because it's the right thing to do. All right, so as a pastor, I, I share things and I, I teach things. And so many times the question comes up, why? That's a fair question. Why? All right, so don't do this or do this or, you know, why? And if I could take the word of God and share from the word of God, all right? So I, I take the word of God. I answer the question, the why question. But yet people do not accept that answer. They do not like that answer. Why do you do what you do? Why? Well, this is the reason why. And they don't accept that. They don't believe it. But get me, let me tell you something. The Bible is still right. Amen. Men are wrong. People are wrong sometimes. And men are right. And they're right at sometimes. But what does the Bible say? So if, if you ask me why, and I give you a verse of scripture to substantiate uh, why, well, you say, okay, I'm going to keep the commandments of God. But because it doesn't fit your narrative, you don't like it. So you don't do it. And then we get up and talk about what is right and things are going wrong in your life and things are all messed up. Why are things messed up? Because you haven't done what you've already been told. Are you tracking with me now? So in the word of God, we read about men and women of God, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Joshua, Esther, Ruth, and many others. Not only did they profess to know the true and living God, their lives and character proved that they were truly following God. Let me tell you something. God is still looking for men and women of integrity. People who are not for sale. Hmm. Those who are honest from the heart to the surface. Not for sale. So I invite people. I invite people for dinner. We do different activities. And, uh, well, you know, we'll see it, 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 what they're doing. What they're telling me is if I can better find a better option, I'm going to go do that rather than this. Right? That's crazy, isn't it? But it happens all the time. People are looking for things, and, and uh, we, we can't be for sale. And, and you know why I'm not for sale? Because I've already been bought. What do you mean? I've already been bought. I've already been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible said. We have been bought with a price. We belong to Jesus. I'm not for sale. I belong to God. That doesn't mean the devil sometimes tries to come in and make a bid for your life and say, wait a minute, devil. I don't have time for you. I, I've been bought by the blood of Christ. I belong to Jesus. You can't have me. He has a deed to my heart and in my life. He's looking for people who will not accept wrong in others and wrong in themselves. Now, you might be wrong about something. I'm not going to stone you. I'm not, I'm not Old Testament here. I'm not going to beat you down. I'm going to pray for you, try to help you. But I'm not going to say it's all right. They don't like that. People don't like that when someone dares to say, that's wrong. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who do you think you are? I know who I am. Who do you think you are? To claim that you're a child of God, but you're living in sin. God's looking for people who stand up for what is right. Amen? People who know their place and fill it. Those who know their own business. There's a lot of people who get involved with everybody else's business. You know, in my life, uh, I... Even as a pastor, I try not to get involved in people's lives unless they ask me to. I'll preach the gospel. I'll share the gospel. That's what he's told me to do. That's what he's called me to do. And now you might be doing something I might really not agree with. But unless you ask me to get involved, I'm not going to get involved. Unless it, talk, and now if I find yourself going headlong into sin, I might preach about something. But I'm not going to get all involved in the micromanagement of your life. Unless you ask me to get involved. Amen? Why? I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to believe God. I may preach about something that may get on your case. But guess what? That's between you and God. Praise the Lord. God's looking for men and women of integrity who will not lie. Lying is still a sin. Bible tells us in, Re in Revelation 21 and 8. After the seventh comma. That all liars shall have their place in a lake of fire. That's pretty serious, isn't it? People who will not lie, those who are not lazy to work. 
I would like to see this place filled to capacity on Easter morning. Actually, on every Sunday morning. But this coming Easter is just a few weeks away. Let's fill this place for the glory of God. Amen? But it's not going to happen just because we're talking about it. Right. Remember, A is for action. Yes. All right. People who will say what they mean and mean what they say. God's looking for these people. Men and women who will serve God. This is what faith and real integrity is all about and does. It's been said, I read this somewhere, it's always been safe to trust those who trust themselves. But when a man suspects his own integrity, it's time that he was suspected by others. We have to live right. All right, so I began this service by reading about Job. Job was a true man of faith. He held on to his integrity. The man was tested. But no matter how difficult it got for Job, he would not entertain the thought of cursing God. He, he would not, he did not even come to a place where he wanted to blame God for all that had happened. So you look at it there in chapter 1, and, and he's not going to put these up. I'm just going to go through these verses real quick. I'm not going to read them. But verse 14, the messenger came with the news that all of his oxen were stolen and his servants were killed. And then in verse 16, while he was talking, another came and said, fire burnt up his sheep and some more of his servants. And then in verse 17, and while he was yet speaking, wow, while he was talking and told him all his camels had been stolen and more servants slain. And while another came, and this time it hit closer to home, he said, while his sons and daughters were drinking wine, the wind blew and the house fell on them and killed them as well. Wow. Talk about a bad day. Right? But what did Job do? Job was a man of uprightness. He had integrity. So what happened? He got mad and he stomped around and he kicked the goat. No. The Bible said that he fell onto the ground and worshipped. All these things had transpired. He didn't understand, no doubt, what in the world was going on. But he fell down on the ground and he began to worship his God. He lost everything that was close, everything that was near and dear to him except his loving, encouraging wife. She pulled up beside him and told him, you should just go ahead and curse God and die. But we find out that Job, he had real faith. And thank God for men and women who have a real faith in God. And even though we don't understand, I'm in the battle, I'm in the trial, I don't know what's happening. I'm going to get down and I'm going to worship my God. I'm going to lift up Jesus because he's the one who has it all in control. We need to be like Job. Faith will believe God when everything is going fine. And faith will believe him when things don't go our way. Faith. And then I already sh I shared, remember that integrity does what is right when no one else is around. How do you remember the story of Joseph? Anybody? Joseph, he was a son of Jacob, and he was sold into slavery by his brethren, his brothers. And they stripped off his coat of many colors and lied about him being killed by a wild animal. And so later on, Joseph ended up in Egypt. He ended up in Potiphar's house, and where he was promoted because, and he became great because the Lord was with him. When you do and live for God on a daily basis, God will go with you. He served God, even though he was in a strange land. All right, and he did that which was right in the eyes of God. All right, I thought about that. You're in the military. You're away from home. You're in Fort Riley. Call it a strange land if you want to. 
and you're here. But I believe if you have the right integrity, the right faith in God, that you can still serve the Lord. You don't have to give in to the attitudes and the depressions that come with Fort Riley or being in the military. You can say, wait a minute. I know that my God has saved me. I got saved because I went to Fort Riley. So praise the Lord for Fort Riley. Even though we might be in a strange land, I believe we can live for God. When you are genuinely saved, now notice I said genuinely saved, right? And you're right with God. You're going to have some consistency to your life. Joseph was there, right? But he had consistency. He went through a lot of things. People today, they, I really think that they need some consistency in their life. All right? Sometimes you have the problems that you have because you are not consistent. Sometimes up, other days down, left and right. You're living for God this day. The next week, you're not living for God. You're not consistent. I understand, I understand things happen. But that's when we look at ourselves, as I already talked about, and put some consistency in there. Put some consistency in your Bible reading. Put some consistency in your prayer life. Plan it. Schedule it if you have to. If you don't have the discipline to... to um, to do it your own, make a, make a chart, make a plan, and follow it. At this time, I'm going to get up 10 minutes earlier in the morning, I'm going to pray. Consistency. Do whatever works for you, but be consistent. Don't be consistency, consistently lazy. Yes, sir. We're good at that, aren't we? How many are good at consistently procrastinating? I don't, I don't, raise you. I don't want to know. <laughs> Pastor, ask me later. No, 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 no. And we procrastinate. I'll do better tomorrow. I'll start praying tomorrow. How many of you ever been on a diet? So you start out really good, right? I'm going to go on this diet. You know why we don't lose weight? Because we're not consistent. I don't know why I can't bench 300 pounds. Because you only go to the gym once a year. You're not consistent. How many know what I'm talking about, right? So go, and that, that touches so many areas of our life, right? But what about our life for God? We have to be consistent. All right, I don't care. I don't care if you ever lose any weight. If you've got to open up both doors for you to come in, it doesn't really matter. But what matters is how is your life before the Lord, amen? And that's what we need to be consistent in. That's what I need to be consistent in. So let's get back to Joseph. Potter's, Potiphar's wife. She began to put the moves on Joseph. She saw him working. And she got the eyes for him. You know what I mean by that, right? Hmm. Look at Joseph over there. Hmm. She got eyes. You know what that means. And she wanted him to go to bed with her. But Joseph refused her advances. Isn't that awesome? He said, no, no, that's not going to happen. You know what? I believe God is looking for people of integrity that are going to do right what is right. Amen? In Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, he said, he said, there's none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me. He's talking to, jo uh, to Potiphar's wife. This is Joseph. Back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He's like, no, I'm not going to do this. Uh, no, Potiphar's wife, you can't have me. I belong to God. You have a husband. I'm not going to do this sin. Church, that's the way we need to be. We've got to say, wait a minute. No, no, just say no to sin. The problem is you say yes. Sin is still sin. I don't care what you say. Verse 11. 39 and 11. He's like, in other words, he can get out. And she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So there she was. Hey, hey Joseph, big boy, why don't you come over here? Maybe she fixed her hair or something. I don't know. Put on some perfume. You know, there's Joseph. What's that smell? And there she was. Hey, come on. And he, she grabbed him. 
That's pretty bold, is it not? And, man, I don't know how it was, but I imagine him slithering out of that whatever, that jacket or thing, whatever he had on. He said, no. She said, come on, lie with me. No, no, no. And there, there all she had was, I mean, it's almost like a cartoon. You know, the feet go, and leave the dust. And, he's, and she's standing there holding the garment. I'm sure it wasn't quite like that, but my imagination thinks things like that. And there she was. Well, she got mad, and there's more to the story after that, but God utilized that to elevate him even higher, all right? But the thing about it is, because of his integrity, he made a stand. He said, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm not going to sin. Oh, she might be attractive. She might smell good, and nobody's going to find out, but there is a God in heaven. He said, I cannot sin against my God, and you know what? I think we need to be the same way. We are not going to sin against our God make up in your mind wait a minute it's not worth it my soul is not for sale what shall a prophet of man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul thank you Jesus that you gave me the ability to stand many people do things so they won't get in trouble or they or they'll do things to try not to get caught and, and people people are shifty sometimes I know I'll just go sin during church time because no one's going to catch me because all the Christians will be in church. There's still a God in heaven. Integrity does what is right because it's right. We have to be what God wants us to be. Will you do? Will you do what is right? And will you have faith in him? Will you give your life to him? And, and nowadays you say things as preachers and people get really upset at you. We live in a day and age where people are really living loose living. Amen? And they do whatever they want to do. But if you really want to go to heaven, you can't do whatever you want to do. Amen? How's your integrity right now? Does your integrity need a restoration? Do you find yourself living one way in front of Christians and a different way at home or at work? Faith. That belief in God and that action. And because of that action, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to have integrity. I'm going to stand for God even when my friends and my family don't understand. If you have friends that say, well, why are you going to church? You should say to them, come with me. Yes, right? Live correctly. And you should do right regardless of what your friends say. Yeah. I know there's a lot of peer pressure. And your friends can try to get you to do things that you don't want to do. Amen? How do we understand peer pressure? And they'll say, they'll say things to you. Say, no, I don't want to do that. And they'll make lies about you. I can give you an example. I can give you an example. Pastor, ride the elephant at the circus. I don't want to ride the elephant. You're scared of the elephant. You're scared to get on the elephant. Oh, oh, hi, Jonah. You're still scared, Pastor. I'm not scared. You didn't ride? I didn't want to. I didn't want to hurt the elephant. So I'm using that as, as an example, peer pressure. And that's minor. That's not sin. It wasn't sin not to ride the elephant. I, and I said, no, I'm a free moral agent, just like the rest of us are, right? But what about when there's sin involved? That's when you have to turn to the side of God, even if it means that you're not going to be right with your friends. What's more, more important, your friends or your God? Integrity. As you bow your heads and close your eyes in reverence to the Lord.